This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. special event, The Road Forward, The Future of Black Education in the 21st Century. I'm Betsy Brenner. I'm chair of the Department of Education. Um, my faculty in the Department of Education, we spend all of our time thinking about how to improve schools, teaching, learning, and so on. But in fact, to deal with the inequities and problems that we face in education today, we need all of the campus, we need all of society to get involved. And that's the reason we organized this event today, to bring together voices from across the campus. I want to acknowledge our planning committee, which is myself, uh, Diane Fugino from the Center for Black Studies Research. I don't think Diane's here. Um, oh, Diane, thank you. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Stewart from the Department of Black Studies up here in front, Jeffrey, and Harry Winant from the Center for New Racial Studies. Thank you for helping us to pull this together. Um, um, we were the planners, but we have an enormous number of sponsors from around the entire campus. They're listed in your program, and I won't mention all of them, but I would like to um, acknowledge the acting dean of the Gewertz Graduate School of Education, Merith Cosden, um, the dean of, executive dean of LNS, uh, Melvin Oliver, who's right there, <laughs> and anyone else here who is a sponsor of this event. So the way we're going to do this today, we have our two speakers that Dr. Jeffrey Stewart will introduce. They will each do a brief presentation about their work. Um, then there will be a moderated discussion led by Dr. Stewart. But because this is an event where we want input from lots of people, we've dedicated time to questions and answers and dialogue with the audience. And then to keep the dialogue going, we have a reception immediately after this in the lounge over there that everyone is welcome to. So we're aiming to finish this part of the program by 5.30 and then move over for refreshments and further discussion. So welcome everyone and thank you. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. I, um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us to think about some uh, problems and issues that we often don't think about or at least we think about them in silence and in private. And so the whole idea of this is to create a conversation that will uh, perhaps uh, begin here, but will extend out uh, afterwards and uh, will perhaps result in other events like this. Um, before going on, I just want to specifically thank uh, 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 Betsy Brenner because she was really the person who uh, got the committee together um, and really organized and has been committed to this kind of conversation 
um, throughout her tenure as uh, chair of the Department of Education. I also want to call two other names, um, Judith Green, who uh, worked with me uh, a couple of years ago in a similar collaboration uh, between the Department of Black Studies and Education to bring Joyce King. And Joyce King is another person that I want to uh, just uh, give a shout out to who's been such a force in AERA and in particular in creating conversations across disciplinary uh, boundaries. So the idea of this road forward is basically to look at both the challenges and the opportunities that face education uh, for black youth in the United States. And in focusing on that uh, particular issue, though, we're not uh, trying to ignore the fact that many of the obstacles that are faced by black youth in education are faced by others, and that potentially some of the uh, innovations that are beginning to develop within the area of black education may be applicable uh, to other groups throughout the society. So our particular focus here is black education, but the larger framework is to think creatively about a transformative education agenda uh, for all students in the United States, perhaps with the uh, situation and gifts of black youth as a focal point for that transformation. Uh, our two guests today are uh, eminent scholars in the area of research and publication, and also, I think, uh, people who conceive of their research as an interventionist project. It's not just simply to publish papers, but also to make a difference through the kind of research that they do, and I think you'll see that pretty quickly when you hear their presentation. Uh, the first is uh, Professor Naila Nasir, who's a uh, H. Michael and Jean Williams Chair of African American Studies uh, and also holds the Bergano Chair in Educational Disparities at the Graduate School of Education at the University of California, Berkeley. Her program of research focuses on issues of race. She's published widely, uh, and she's a person who is working at the intersection between African American studies and education and theorizing new policy uh, at Berkeley. Our second uh, speaker is Ty Professor Tyrone Howard, who's professor of education at UCLA in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies Urban Schooling Division. He's also director of Center X, a consortium of urban school professionals working towards social justice and educational equity in transforming LA schools. Uh, he's director and founder of the Black Male Institute at UCLA. And I will also say a person that I've known that uh, from afar that has also been working to try and transform institutions like ours at UCLA and other places, because I think some of the obstacles that we see in the K through 12 are in different form operative at the high school, at the higher education level as well. So both of these people have been excellent activist scholars, and I'm really looking forward to their presentations. Please welcome uh, Naila Nasir. I got this multiple mic situation happening. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am honored to be here. Thank you for the invitation and all the work of the planning committee. Um, particularly honored to share the stage with my friend and brother, Tyrone Howard. Um, so my talk for this afternoon is titled, Why Race Matters for Education and What Schools Can Do About It. And I think what I, one of the things I appreciated about your framing of this event is that often when we're talking about race, we're talking about everything that's wrong. And, and those conversations can leave us and our students feeling a little bit hope, hopeless. Um, so what I'll conclude with today, and, and actually a lot of the data I'll talk about, is about an intervention in um, Oakland that focuses on how can we think about race from the perspective of a school district in a new, innovative way, and what kinds of practices can we implement um, to better support our students. So for today, I'm going to start with just um, kind of some of the big questions that um, I take up in my work, 
and uh, some ideas, concepts, definitions. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how students cope with and sometimes resist racial stereotypes. Um, I'll say some about this project on the African American Male in Initiative in Oakland, looking at the ways in which that initiative has created alternative school spaces um, in support of black male identity. Um, and then I'm going to squeeze in there, if I have time, a little bit on a new study. Uh, I'll keep you in suspense on that and then conclude. Um, so my work takes up several kind of big overarching questions. First, how do we understand and account for the processes of culture, race, and racial stratification in relation to schooling and learning? Second, what role does identity play in this process? I see identity as an important mediator. And how are identities made available in learning settings? Um, I'll say some about that. I have a, you know, the, I put the picture of the book there because if you want to read more about um, how I conceptualize identity, um, I think about identity not just as what people bring into a setting, which is how we typically think about it, but rather what a setting tells you about who you are and, and, and the types of identities that are made available as you engage in social, social interaction with others. And then finally, what are some possibilities for repositioning or creating new identity opportunities for students? So a few kind of underlying assumptions to begin. And I shortened this. This was like five slides, but I was like, I only have 20 minutes. Um, so I crunched it all in there. A few assumptions, and these assumptions are um, supported by research and theory, but I won't have the time to go through all of that, so you have to take my word for it. Um, the first is that learning is an inherently cultural endeavor. Right? This is very different than the conventional wisdom on culture and learning that would argue that culture only affects the way we learn if we are culturally different. different. Put more frankly, this way of thinking asserts that culture, um, this, this conventional way of thinking asserts that culture inhibits learning for students of color because, because they are different, often code for deficient. But I argue that learning is cultural for everyone. Right? That is, it takes place within social and cultural contexts, schools, community centers, museums, families. It occurs uh, with social interactions, in social interactions with others, peers, teachers, parents, siblings. It occurs in the service of social and cultural goals, to get into college, to win a game, to figure out a computer program. And it takes place with key cultural artifacts at the center of the activity, desks, pencils, computers, et cetera. So in every way, learning is culturally, in cultural, cultural inherently. The second is that schools are cultural institutions, right? in that they are culturally lived and experienced. They're culturally organized, guided by norms, conventions, artifacts, and social interaction. They're potential spaces of empowerment, of marginalization, of identity building. And they are spaces where cultural and identity trajectories are offered and taken up. And finally, I make the assumption that race matters in school. It's one of the many cultural and societal notions that takes up a particular kind of life in schools. I argue that it does so in two key ways. First. It can constrain or enable access to quality schooling and quality learning environments, which are largely stratified in the United States by race. Right? So there's an access issue around the way race takes up life in schools. Second, and I'm going to say much more about this today, is through racial stereotypes. Right? Racial stereotypes are a key way that race plays out in schools. Schools are places where stereotypes become what I call racial storylines. They are lived, invoked, used, reproduced, resisted. Right? So they take up life in schools. They organize our perceptions, opinions, and they organize opportunity. Um, so I make, as I lay out this connection between racial storylines and learning, I lay out four core arguments. The first is that racial storylines are prevalent in our society and have powerful implications for learners. The second is that these racial storylines are a critical aspect of life in schools, and they racially and academically socialize students. So they're doing work right, as they exist in schools. As these storylines are invoked in school settings, certain identities are made available, imposed, or closed down. And identities are critical for engagement in learning settings and thus for learning. And so I'll go back to these kind of four core arguments throughout, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an organizing frame. So let's turn to some data. I'm going to start with a bit of data from a study of students' awareness and negotiation of racial stereotypes about who can be good at school and who could be good at math. Um, and the study asked two primary questions, which you know, I, I often do studies that I, I think that my grandmother would be um, 
quite ashamed that I spend so much time and energy on things that everybody knows. Um, but that's kind of what we do as scholars. Um, so the study asked two primary questions. Are elementary and middle school students aware of racial stereotypes about who's good at school? And do they hold these stereotypes? And second, for students from groups who are negatively stereotyped with respect to school, African American and Latino students in particular, how do they manage the burden of potentially being stereotyped? What do these forms of management mean for their engagement and achievement in school? So the question is, we know that there are these strong, long-standing, pervasive stereotypes about who can be good at school and who can be good at math. The question is, do kids in a progressive, diverse California city um, are they aware of these stereotypes and do they hold them? So I'll just cut to the findings. You can't see that chart very well. But basically the findings show that yes, kids are very much aware of stereotypes. There's some developmental changes that happen between elementary school and middle school. Um, by and large, kids are both aware of and come to endorse stereotypes by middle school. And this is kids across racial groups. And, and third there is that African American and Latino students are more likely to be aware of racial stereotypes, but less likely to endorse them. And I want to kind of just sit there for a second, because what does it mean to be aware that you have, that, that there is the potential for you being stereotyped, but not to yourself believe that's true? What burden does that put on you for managing that set of perceptions? So the second part of this study, that, that first part was a survey study of about 150 middle school and um, elementary school students. The second part was a case study, a qualitative study, where we, we observed kids for a six to eight month period in their math classes and interviewed them several times. And what we, what we and, the, and the question we're asking there is how do kids manage this potential burden of being stereotyped? Do they experience it and how do they manage it? And what we found is basically there were several approaches that students use, these are African American and Latino students, um, in reaction to the potential for being stereotyped, right? The first approach students used, it's not really an approach, but so there was some subset of students who were just unaware that these stereotypes existed. And this proved to be actually a very, um, a very uh, useful strategy in that if you were aware that racial stereotypes existed, you were doing pretty well academically. Raising your hand in class, engaging in the discussion, the, the grades were pretty good. Um, the problem was that they, by seventh grade, there was no one left in this category. So it, it was good while it lasted. The second strategy was kids who decided that, well, OK, you say that I'm a black girl, and black girls are supposed to be loud and unengaged. Then that's what I'm going to be. So kids who took up the stereotypes, who decided, this is how you see me. This is who I will be. And that, as you can imagine, was um, pretty detrimental for school performance and engagement. Students were not doing well academically and were uh, relatively unengaged in the classroom. The third strategy I thought was, was, um, was quite interesting. These are kids who distanced themselves from the stereotype, who said, yes, I believe that the stereotype about my group is true, but I'm not one of them. I'm different. Like, and this worked well in terms of academic achievement, but caused students um, a significant amount of anxiety around whether or not they were qualified, whether or not they were smart. So they were doing decently well academically, but there was a level of kind of social anxiety about life in the classroom that was really challenging. And the final group of kids um, were kids who resisted the stereotypes, who, who made the argument that, yeah, I know society says these things, but those things are not true. And I know plenty of examples of people who don't fit the stereotype. And I'm um, going to prove to you that this stereotype does not exist. And these kids were doing quite well academically and, and actually had developed interesting strategies for how they would show up in the classroom space to, so that everyone knew that they were smart and they were engaged and they were doing well. So, so what was kind of interesting about that is, in, um, is when we embarked upon this work, um, it was kind of at the moment where we had started as a nation talking about being in this post-racial moment. And so really, it was an open question about whether or not students really did think about and talk about race. And again, this is a progressive multicultural school um, in the South Bay in Northern California. And so the, the fact that race was so prevalent for kids and, and so prevalent for their lives and the way they thought about themselves in school was really kind of interesting and, and profound and sobering for us as a research team. So much so that kids said to us, this was the first time I've ever talked about race in school. And so here you have kids who are clearly experiencing race on a daily basis, but no one's talking to them about it. So um, this, this example I like to share, and I, I, I know there's a lot of text for a slide, but I want to say one more thing about stereotypes before I move on. Um, remember that I talked about these stereotypes as racial narratives, right, as, as, as doing work 
in social environments. And, and this example really, I think, is a nice example of how stereotypes are used to position people. They don't just kind of sit in the air dead. They, they are invoked and lived. So this transcript comes from um, a study by one of my graduate students, Nero Shaw. And his study was about um, stereotypes that Asians are good at math and the way that those were um, took up life in classrooms. So this, this transcript comes from an interview of an African-American ninth grader, um, a young man who's very, very good at math and, and has a strong sense of himself in the math classroom. And so the interviewer, Neryl, asks him, do you think those stereotypes are affecting non-Asian kids in their math experiences? And he's talking about stereotypes about Asians being good at math. Do they affect kids who are not Asian? Right? And the student says, yeah. Because this is my personal experience. Because if I see, like, I'm pretty sure if a black kid sees an Asian kid get an A on a test, it's like, I wish I could do that. Or I'm never going to do that because I must have been, for him, it's super easy. It's like he's super smart, and I'm nowhere near as smart as him. I'm never going to be able to do that. So it affects him mentally, which in turn affects the outcome of, of his or her performance. Right? So it's kind of talking about the way in which the stereotype becomes a standard by which students compare themselves to. Right? But then he goes on. The, the, the interviewer asks, have you seen that affect friends of yours in that way? And Will says, because of someone else's performance? Yeah. There are kids in the class who see other kids get A's. Well, it's like one of my friends. He saw me get an A, and he had, they had me pinned for the stereotypical African-American male who wasn't going to do good in math. He saw me get an A, and he thought he was going to be able to get an A, but then he wasn't. Then he saw me as like, oh, you're hecka smart. You must have some Asian in you. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I, I think this, this um, this example is so poignant because what it points to is the way in which, even as a counterexample to the stereotype, the stereotype looms large and gets used to position this kid then as, well, you can't really be black and be good at math. Right? So this, this data comes from a, a study of a, another one of my graduate students, um, Aaliyah Holman. And we interviewed um, parents about their kind of racial socialization strategy. And one of the one, black parents, uh, parents of black children, I should say. And um, this issue of stereotype and stereotype management came across really strongly in these interviews as well, where parents reported that they spent a lot of time and energy working to reframe students' expectations and prepare them for discrimination, right? To say that you will be stereotyped in these ways, and this is how, this is what you can expect the world to do. They taught students strategies to minimize racial harm, right? Like if you're walking down the street and the police stop you, you say yes, sir. You. Um, and they intervene as advocates on the part of their children, modeling for their children a proactive approach to combating racism. So again, for these black parents, the issue of race was really, really salient in their management of their, their kids' school lives in ways that we were um, both surprised, I guess, and, and not surprised. And it was also interesting that parents had talked also about the way in which they weren't sure if their, if their students were going to be faced with these issues of race as they had been. And, and, and actually, many of them did not have racial conversations with their kids early on because they assumed they didn't need to anymore. And so these conversations about race actually happened in reaction to a child coming home and having had some racial incident at school and the parent realizing, oh, wow, this is something we still do need to talk about. So this is a quote from one parent who says, there's a certain demeanor that I think you need to have. And this is this parent talking about what she, um, how she helps her child prepare. Because they expect, for some, they expect the worst from us. I always tease him, you got to go represent. You do. I'm teaching him to have a relationship with his teachers because they tend to look at us as, OK, you're probably here under a grant. Are you here for sports? I mean, it's human nature. So I encourage him to have a relationship with them. Go in, ask the questions, be involved, be attentive. So in other words, she's got a, a narrative around how race is going to matter for her child. And she's explicit in these conversations with her child about, about how to manage that. So just think about, like, for a moment, the amount of time and energy that goes into the management of this in families and in kids' own heads and among peer groups, it becomes this thing that we think has gone away is actually still very, very prominent in the lives of kids and families. So what can we do? Where, where is there a spot of hope in all of this? Um, 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about a study that we did in Oakland. In 2010, the Oakland Unified School District started the African American Male Initiative, which was, was an initiative of a new superintendent, a very progressive white superintendent, who um, had the philosophy that because black male students were among the lowest achieving in Oakland, that if you create an infrastructure to address their needs and support their achievement, um, you would support the achievement of all students, the kind of rising tide lifts all boats philosophy. Um, so the initiative had a number of programs that it ran. One of its biggest and most prominent programs was called the Manhood Development Program. And it was a district-sponsored program for African-American male students. Um, it started out in the first few years for seventh through ninth graders. And it was innovative in many ways. One of the ways in which it was innovative is that it wasn't an add-on class. It was a class that took part as a normal part of the school day. So it was a, in one period a day where kids went to a class that was all black male students with a black male instructor. The other thing that was innovative about it is that the instructors were not certified teachers. Um, and that wasn't actually in, a, a part of the initial design. The, initially, the program um, administrators went into schools to try to recruit teachers to do this work and found that there weren't enough black male teachers who were qualified to teach these classes. So they recruited folks from the community who had um, most often community development um, backgrounds and um, put them in the classroom with, with kids. And so our study was about what happened when they all got there. What did this, what did this space look like? What are the ways race got, got talked about? What are the identity work that happened in this space? And I, I sent out a piece that I'm, some of you may have read um, that was focused on looking at what discipline looked like in these spaces. Because one of the very first things we noticed in talking to students and in observing these classes was the way discipline happened, and by that I mean kind of punishment in schools, the way discipline happened in these classes was very, very different than the way that it happened for students in other spaces of the school and in other classrooms. And so we have a lot to say about that. Um, the first thing that we did, though, um, was to interview students about their experiences of race in school. So these are interviews with 50 to 60 African American male ninth graders. Um, and lo and behold, surprise, surprise, students reported that, um, that their teachers had low expectations for their academic achievement, that their teachers didn't care about them as African-American male students. So it wasn't just they don't care about me, they don't care about me because I am African-American and male. And students felt that they were frequently subject to racist stereotypes and unjust disciplinary action. This issue of discipline was really, really prominent in their, in their lives. I won't, I won't say a whole lot about it today. Um, so our study, you know, as I, as I said, was about what characterizes these classrooms, what happens within them. Um, I sent the paper out about discipline, so I'm not going to talk too much about that, though there were some fascinating examples of new ways that discipline got enacted that, and, and that essentially allowed kids to hold on to their humanity and um, created a space where it was OK for them to express themselves culturally, that, that their behavior, um, even if it were a little bit outside of the norms or conventions of a classroom did not get them labeled as defiant and did not, under most any condition, get them sent out. Students talked a lot about their experiences being sent out of classrooms. Um, in this classroom, that was not, that was not, the, that was not the experience. Um, but for today, I'm going to say a little bit more about um, that second bullet. So um, w the first thing that we noticed was these new kinds of disciplinary practices and that these classrooms were kind of hybrid spaces, community spaces and classroom spaces. Um, the second was that there was a lot of work that happened there explicitly around debunking or reframing stereotypes about black males. Um, and again, these were spaces that students did not have access to before. So just to have a space where they could have a conversation that says, this is what the world expects of you. How, how are you different than that? What, what choices do you have around meeting those expectations or not? And then it, these were spaces where um, there was a ton of attention paid to building community and creating these multi-layered relationships between instructors and students and peers and, and administrators. Um, so a few things more about what they did around debunking stereotypes about, about black males. Um, our analysis of the data showed that there were basically four stereotypes that they were debunking in this space. The first was that black males are hard and unemotional. So the kind of anti-emotional, if you're a man, you're not sensitive stereotype. Um, the second stereotype that they debunked was that black males don't do school. The third was that black males don't prioritize the domestic sphere, in other words, their roles as sons or brothers or husbands. And the, and the, the fourth was that black males are criminal, right? debunking that stereotype. And they did this in, in three key ways. The first was that they engaged in explicit discussions of black manhood, which is to say, 
um, have, having class discussions around what it means to be a black man, what it means to be a man, what the media portrays, how what you experience in your everyday life is different than that. Um, there was also a lot of attention to role modeling and both bringing in various community members or university people who model different ways of being than those kind of stereotypical images, but also drawing on historical role models. Paul Robeson, right, to say there's this huge range and you don't have to be at this kind of narrow end of it. And then finally, just providing and building a uh, caring, nurturing community where kids had the opportunity to practice these new ways of being. And so I'll, I'll end with um, a bit of a description of the new, newest study where we went from looking at just these particular classroom spaces to looking district-wide and saying, what are the schools in this district that are having success with African-American students? And we, so we looked at a range of, of um, outcomes and indicators and chose five schools that were pretty successful. And I say pretty successful because none of them were all that successful. Um, but there were some that were clearly better than others in the district. So we did case studies of five schools, one high school, two middle schools, two elementary schools, um, and we, a range of methods including classroom and school observations, interviews with parents, teachers, administrators. And the preliminary findings are, I mean, this stuff is just fascinating, at least it's fascinating to me. The first thing, and I think this, I'll talk about this and then I'll turn it over to, um, I'll say a few concluding thoughts and turn it over to Tyrone. Um, and, and because I think this is the most interesting for me right now, is that these were schools that conceptualized what they did. You know, there's a lot of work around caring and how caring matters for teaching and how caring matters for educational institutions. These folks took things a step further. And they not only were thinking about how they cared for kids, but they thought about how they were protecting kids from the kind of racialized harm that schools tend to impose upon them. So this notion of protection became really central in how these schools operated. They saw themselves as an oasis, right, both in terms of kids' schooling experiences elsewhere, but also relative to some of the treacherous community environments that kids were navigating. So more about that in the Q&A if you're interested. Just to finish up, um, identity is critical to the learning process. Uh, negative racial and ethnic stereotypes impact access to learning identities. Students must find ways to manage the racial stereotypes that others apply to them, thus finding ways to reposition themselves and take up new, um, new identities. And students often experience schools as highly racialized settings, and schools have to find ways to better support students um, by not imposing racialized harm and supporting them in developing positive racial and learning identities. And I will end there. Thank you. Good afternoon. How's everyone? All right. Okay, you guys got to wake up out there. Good afternoon. How are we doing? Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay, I got to feel you. I'm, I'm a product of the Black Baptist Church, so call and response <laughs> matters a lot to me. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, my name is Tyrone Howard. I'm a professor of education at UCLA, and I want to thank the folks who made this possible today, from Howie and Diane and uh, Jeffrey and the Olivers and Betsy. I thank you all for, for, uh, for having uh, me here. And, <laughs> for the opportunity to share the, the podium with my dear friend and colleague, uh, Naila. We go way back, like 20 years or so back, back when we didn't know which way was up and if we would ever get to do this work. So you never know the, the kind of connections you make when you're, you're younger coming up in this work. So it's an honor and a privilege. And every time I hear a present, I think I should have went first, because it's always hard <laughs> to follow folks. But I'm going to try to do my best. Uh, it's always good to be back here, too. I have vivid memories of this place. I did my undergraduate degree at UC Irvine. And I played on the basketball team at UC Irvine. And we never won here, so it always kind of stays in my <laughs> crawl. So anyway, I digress. So I want to use this uh, opportunity today to talk about uh, some of my work around this notion of who really cares, race, education, and opportunity in the 21st century. And I want to use it, if I can, to, to really kind of walk. I see what I, I think are a number of students. Can I see by show of hands students, undergraduate, graduate students? Perfect, okay. So I'm gonna really go into teaching mode today as best as I can. I wanna use it as a chance to kind of help you walk through the way in which we are doing some work, but I wanna kind of frame this around larger opportunity gaps, achievement gaps, the disparities. They've been used uh, in different ways, but I also wanna kind of offer some advice on how I think undergraduate students as well as graduate <laughs> students should think about the framing of their own research 
uh, around these topics. And then I want to drill down a little bit further and give you a glimpse into one study that we've got uh, looking at issues around uh, access and education. So, so tip number one for my students, uh, I'm a big fan of music, uh, hip hop, R&B, and the like. So what I would offer to my graduate students and undergraduate students here is to understand that you can incorporate music into your work. I think musicians are some of our biggest philosophers and biggest scholars around. Um, so find ways to use those words and let them illuminate the, the social conditions that exist in communities that we find ourselves a part of. And so I'm a big Marvin Gaye guy. And so you know, I, can, I, can, I can go toe to toe with you on any of Marvin Gaye's lyrics. And so one of the ones that really stands out for me is this notion of who really cares. And in the, in the, in the lyrics, Marvin Gaye really poses the question uh, of just asking the idea of who really cares to save a world in despair. Uh, and he talked about the fact that children today are really going to suffer tomorrow. And I think that serves as a perfect context for looking at some of the educational outcomes for a number of our students in schools today. I think it begs the question of who really cares, because given the conditions and the kinds of circumstances that far too many young people find themselves in, it leads us to ask who really cares. And many young people are telling us every single day, every single day that they don't believe anyone cares or not enough people care. So we have got to think long, hard, and collectively about how we begin to demonstrate care in a sustained and an authentic fashion to begin to disrupt some of the issues that we see in schools. You can have programs, you can have policies, you can have initiatives, but I think until you have a real deep-seated ethic of care uh, as a part of this work, we're going to continue to see these gaps exist. Okay? So first point is to understand we should ask these most poignant questions. And in this case, the question is centered around this idea of who really cares. So part of what I also want you to understand for my graduate students and undergraduate students, it always helps to frame the problem in some form of data. So what I want to use today as a, as a way of framing this issue is looking at disparities along racial lines. And I could bore you to, 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 to tears with a lot of different charts and graphs, but I'm going to promise you that I won't do too much of that. But it's good to anchor your argument around data that help to demonstrate the way in which disparities exist. And you have to do that because what you will continue to find is that there are naysayers out there who just don't believe that these disparities exist, who will tell you that this is 2015 and, and that we have come a long way and we made progress and we don't have to worry about that. We're on a much level playing field now, despite the fact that data tells us that we are not quite there. So what you see here, for example, is one point of data that speaks to the fact that there are clear racial disparities when it comes to high school graduation. I think we have to mention, as Professor Nasir mentioned, the fact that race matters in schooling experiences. And this data right here will tell you that there are disparate outcomes when we look at high school graduation, the fact that African American and Latino students still find themselves lagging behind uh, their white and certain Asian counterparts where uh, high school graduation is concerned. Some will have you believe that this is not a racial issue, it's a social class issue. However, data still suggests that when we hold uh, social class constant, there's still racial disparities. So part of what you want to use is evidence and data to help them make the case. It's not just with high school graduation where we see these, these disparities. We also see them in areas such as advanced coursework. So part of what I encourage you to do is drill down further. So even for those students who do graduate, when we talk about access to college, you all know that you can't just do basic classes that are required for graduation. You can't just do A through G. It's about more advanced courses. We see some clear racial disparities here. African American and Latino students, again, making up smaller populations of the larger uh, population of schools, yet their numbers are increasing. But we look at the numbers who end up taking advanced coursework and end up taking AP exams is much lower than the overall population in schools. And what we like to see is some degree of, of, of parity across the board. That if we have Latino students, for example, who are making up 18% of students in schools, that they're roughly around that same percentage of test takers and those who pass. So again, part of what we do to help to anchor our argument is to use the data to tell our story. Same thing when it comes to issues of, of disparities in school discipline. Here's where we have some major disparities that we oftentimes don't want to talk about. And I think Naila's work really kind of nicely spoke of that, is that we see some harsh circumstances that show the fact that, that black children in particular, males and females, are disciplined at a much higher rate uh, than their counterparts from non-black backgrounds. Uh, and part of what we have to ask the question is, why is that we continue to see these really clear racial ramifications associated with discipline? Uh, and we have lots of data that show that students in so-called integrated or mixed schools find that, uh, that there's a clear de demarcation in terms of how similar behavior is dealt with very differently. And that difference in terms of how it's dealt with is oftentimes racialized in many ways. And part of what we know now 
is that there are data that speaks to the fact that these disparities happen early in schools. And the US Department of Education just issued a report showing that, in particular, black students, and I just find this data just really just mind boggling. Black students now represent about 18% of preschoolers who are enrolled, but they're 42% of all students who are suspended at least once, and 48% of all students who are suspended at least twice. So when we talk about preschoolers, we're talking about four and three and four year olds. I don't know what you do as a four year old to, to merit suspension, but whatever it is, it's happening. It's happening often, and it's happening to African American students, African American males at a significantly higher rate. Thus begging the question again of who really cares? How do we respond when we see any group of students uh, being grossly disproportionate when it comes to certain types of uh, school disciplinary actions? So part of what I want you to understand is you think about how you frame these issues, how you think about how you begin to look at these data that tell a very compelling and oftentimes disturbing reality is how do we then go about trying to understand them? How do we examine them? So we can then develop viable means of intervention around them. Part of what concerns me is that oftentimes when we talk about conversations around disparate outcomes, it's oftentimes a way in which we frame this around how do we fix the students, right? If we can just change their behavior, if we can change their language, if we can change their home environment. So it begs of the, the work that William Ryan did back in the 70s of blaming the victim. We throw the, the onus right back on the individuals and we don't look at larger factors and larger structures that contribute to the circumstances in the first place. And so part of what we see, I recommend that you all, I'm going to go through my reading list here too as I talk about this. So one of the works that you all should read if you're interested in this work is uh, the work that, that Michelle Alexander has done on the new Jim Crow. And in it, she really highlights some of the issues affecting black males that we see playing out in schools, right? Uh, the fact that in 2012, for example, black males comprise approximately 7.5% seven, seven of all students in schools. However, when we look at the ways in which uh, discipline was meted across uh, these different spaces, it told a, a, a very disturbing story. The fact that black males were 42% of all school-aged children who were arrested. They represent 40% of all cases in juvenile court. 65% of all youth in juvenile detention centers, and 60% of the cases were waived to the criminal courts. So again, we're talking about 7% of the population, but you see a significantly high number of, of the young men and young people who are then referred to criminal cases. Once you add Latino males into the same equation, the numbers go even higher. So you look at the fact that black and brown males are less than 20% of all students who are in schools, but when you put those two groups together, they're close to almost 85% of all youth who are in criminal and juvenile courts. That should raise red flags for all of us. We should begin to ask the question again of who really cares. And so I'm going to talk about on the back end how we respond to that, or at least one study we've got that's responding to this very issue. So what do the disparities mean? And here I'm going to refer you to look at the work that's done by, here are some of my favorite works by Massey and Denton that talk about American apartheid. These issues that occur don't just emerge out of nowhere. It's important to understand that these disparities did not occur overnight. And what Massey and Denton walk us through is to acknowledge the past discrimination that has occurred to communities of color and poor communities that help to explain why we are where we are. And to recognize the structural disadvantages uh, that are secured through direct discrimination over time. See, our response as to how we deal with the, 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 the academic or achievement gap is oftentimes how do we put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound? And the gaping wound is not going to be addressed until we get to the root cause of what cause these problems in the first place? And how do we connect the obstacles that we see communities face to unfair and unearned privilege of others that have occurred over time? Uh, again, we can't be in a post-racial period if we've never become racial, right? We can't be a point of saying that we look at this as a meritocracy until we really define who has benefited from certain types of merit. So these are the ways in which we have to analyze current state of affairs. We also have to be clear about the fact that there's a history of education in this country that we have to understand. So if you look at, for example, Joel Spring's work, what Spring talks about is the fact that there's a history of dominated populations and the way in which these groups have been historically marginalized in their quest for education. So you look at the indigenous populations, to enslaved Africans, to uh, Asian immigrants, to even poor whites. Uh, there's been this long narrative around the fact of who deserves access to education and who doesn't. And I think if you look closer at this data as, as, as Spring talks about in this historical trajectory, it's no mistake that the same groups who struggle in schools today are the very groups who were, who were, who were dominated and who were marginalized centuries ago. And for us to think that the remnants don't remain would be very much of a, a, of a misnomer. And part of what we have to also understand, too, is the introduction of a colonial education. So even when education was introduced to dominated populations, it was a form of colonial education that, that, that deculturalized the experiences, 
the histories and the ways of knowing of various populations. So uh, in, my, in my opinion, when analyzing any kind of work on educational disparities, uh, the reading of Joel Spring is a must, okay? Also, uh, got to give a plug to some folks who are here in the audience, right? Uh, another must, must read is the work that's been done by uh, your own uh, Mel Oliver and Thomas Shapiro who look at black wealth and white wealth because if you look at the data here, what we begin to understand is that the experiences that we see people of color uh, facing in this country are also tied to wealth. Uh, and despite the fact that there have been rising incomes amongst folks of color, that still has not changed the wealth disparities that still exist. Uh, and if you see data that was done by the Pew Research Center here, it still shows that the average white family has a, uh, a, a, an estimated wealth of over $140,000 uh, compared to the accumulated uh, wealth for blacks being only around $11,000. Those, those disparities mean something. It means something about the kinds of access to opportunities, the kind of access for, for resources, for, for tutoring, uh, educational experiences. So we cannot look at current discrepancies without understanding the kinds of factors that still play a huge role in how black and brown families experience the United States of America. And then, uh, as, uh, as Naima talked about, the fact that race matters, and racial formation and structural racism are, are, are really integral parts of this narrative, and we have to understand how structural racism uh, plays out in institutions and society, even in 2015. Uh, they play out in a very nuanced way through implicit bias, through policies and procedures, but there are still uh, remnants of it that exist today. And, and, and uh, Howie Wynett, my friend and colleague who's here, talks about looking at racial formation as an analytical tool that begins to construct identity around these different categories that begin to create a hierarchy that places uh, African American and, and Latino folks at the bottom of that hierarchy. And if we don't account for that, we're going to continue to be misguided in our responses to how we deal with inequity. So part of what I'm trying to help is help you understand that this larger sort of structural arrangements that are big, that are real, and that continue to have an impact on, on the fact that certain populations are still not where they should be. Now, I say that because there are those who will say, look, and you all have probably heard this, Racism is, is no longer a factor. Uh, there are folks in this room who are uh, from racially diverse backgrounds. You made it, right? If you made it, why can't more others do just like you? That whole idea, if you show more grit, if you just work hard, if you just sacrifice more, anybody can be successful. And I think we have to be willing to push back against that narrative and help folks to understand the larger set of circumstances that allow one of us to make it. For every one of us who so-called so makes it, there's countless others who are still stuck in that cycle of poverty and hopelessness. So we have to understand the larger arrangement that contributes to that. And how does it play out in schools? So you have to read Gene Anion. Gene Anion talks about the fact that we ask schools to, call, we ask schools to fix problems that schools didn't create and that schools at the, end of the, at the end of the day only mirror our larger society. And she talks about the fact that we have to have a transformation of society by way of increased wages, access to wealth, and restructuring opportunities. Uh, she says we have to have a radical reallocation of opportunity and resources that help us to support what she refers to as the working poor. She really unpacks this narrative around this idea that impoverished people in this country are oftentimes looked at as people who choose to be poor, right? Uh, but what Anya talks about is the fact that the overwhelming number of folks in the society who are poor are oftentimes holding down a single job, sometimes two jobs at a time, but still are stuck and a cycle of poverty. So we have to understand the ways in which poverty continues to encapsulate large numbers of, of individuals in our society. So those are your larger frameworks to understand, right? Uh, and then what does, this do, what does this do? This begins to create trauma in ways that we don't talk about. Uh, if you look at the work from a number of scholars who are beginning to unpack trauma, uh, and some folks even talk about this post-traumatic slave syndrome that's prevalent in African-American communities where you look at issues around community violence and complex trauma and domestic violence, all these factors that are tied to a set of experiences that are linked directly to oppression begin to sort of manifest themselves in ways that people begin to act in ways that are oftentimes inexplicable and beyond uh, comprehension. But when you begin to understand how trauma is, is a part of what so many young people face today, then we begin to see that we can't put just simple band-aids on these issues, but we have to have a, a, a set of wraparound services that deal with issues around mental health and the social emotional trauma that young people are dealing with on a day in, day out basis. But what we also know, it's not just the young people who deal with trauma, but now there's research on secondary trauma. And that secondary trauma are individuals who work with individuals who are experiencing trauma. So what we see in many schools 
are high degrees of stress of teachers, for example, who work in low-income neighborhoods because they are oftentimes ill-equipped to deal with those individuals, so they feel stressed by way of compassion fatigue or vicarious trauma. And we have schools we work with in Los Angeles where we see the turnover rate from teachers from one year to the next being 65, 70% where individual teachers leave the profession because they just are not equipped to deal with the kinds of factors that young people bring to the school from their community. So we have to understand the role that trauma plays. So how does this all play out in school? So I think we have to start large. We have to always think on a broad scale, but begin to act local. So how does it play out in our schools? In, in several ways. So part of what we see now in this post-NCLB era with urban schools is that there's a high degree of standardization, where there's an alignment of scripted curriculum, where teachers are oftentimes told what to say, how to say it in ways that don't allow any autonomy or any creativity for young students, which again, only demoralizes teachers, frustrates students, and makes a, a, a bad problem become much worse. Uh, we have these accountability measures that are in place where low-performing schools are essentially punished if they don't meet certain kinds of criteria. Again, not recognizing that we have young people who are coming to schools without the kind of supports that schools should be providing, yet we still punish those schools. And now we have the opening where we have privatization, where we have a number of different charter schools uh, and voucher programs that come in because the schools who are not servicing students well are looked at as being failures, and then we ask uh, corporate charters and the like to come in to help save the day, which has, has a whole other set of issues that I'll talk about on the back end. So part of what we have to have, what do we do, right? So part of what I hope that the, uh, students think is, what is how do we respond? I, I'm a big advocate of social justice teaching. If you look at the work of folks like Bree Power and Tondika Chapman and, and David Stovall, they talk about social justice teaching as a way in which we respond to these circumstances and how we think about a pedagogical approach uh, in and out of the classroom that seeks to, to, to address uh, academic uh, and, and critical literacy in ways that help students to understand their circumstances, but then begins to move beyond it in ways that offer some viable means of social transformation. So what I want to show with, share with you today is one particular program that is an attempt to do that, because I think sometimes when we look at these larger issues, they become overwhelming, and you say, how can I begin to find my my sort of place to begin to interrogate this. And so I always, I always recommend drilling down into a particular area that you can find some traction. And let me walk you through one of those. So I'm a former elementary school teacher. Uh, and I'm big on literacy. Literacy matters. And there's all kind of data that shows that when students are successful in reading, it contributes to a lot of different edu educational outcomes that are positive. And so I just want to share this one slide here. This is Nate data from 2012 that looks at reading proficiency by grade four. And why I share this slide all the time, because it tells, I think, a, a really compelling story here. Because when you look at grade proficiency with reading, we can begin to predict not only educational outcomes for young people, but we can pretty much predict life chances just based on where students are when it comes to reading proficiency. So if you look at grade four here, it tells us what percentage of students are reading at proficiency by the time they're in fourth grade. And it doesn't tell a really compelling story when you think about it. I mean, even if you look at our white students here, the fact that 42% are at grade level, the inverse of that tells us that 58% are not. That's a problem, right? Over half of any group of students should raise some significant red flags in terms of what we're doing. But when you look at the next two groups, black and Latino students in particular, the fact that over 80% of those students are not reading by grade level uh, should be a national uproar, if you ask me. I mean, this is where you talk about structural arrangements that have put students at a significant disadvantage educationally and in the quest for upper mobility uh, in life. And so part of what I want to share with you is the way in which we have been part of a project for the past couple of years that has taken on literacy as a response to the achievement gap, right? If you begin to move the needle with regard to literacy, you begin to reduce discipline, you begin to reduce dropout rates, and you begin to create a pathway for students to be successful ultimately. So with that, I want to introduce you to uh, the Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools. Uh, and the Freedom Schools have been in place for over 30 years. They're primarily rooted in the South, uh, and their mission is to maintain or improve reading proficiency uh, over the summer months, because data has shown that black and brown kids are, are the biggest uh, victims of this summer slide, where after six, seven, eight months of maybe adequate education, you get two, three months of summer, and that, that progress is, 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 is slowly wiped away. So what the Freedom Schools do, and they're rooted out of the idea that came out in the civil rights with the Mississippi uh, Freedom Summer, uh, is focus on high quality academic enrichment, uh, and a direct focus on literacy, but also tied to issues around social action and civic engagement, uh, there's a focus on intergenerational servant leadership development, 
And as I mentioned earlier, there's this focus on nutrition, health, and mental health. Because part of what the Freedom Schools recognize is that you cannot help students become well academically if they're not well socially, emotionally as well. So I want to just give you a, a brief sna snippet of the work we're doing with Freedom Schools, and then uh, you, we can prepare for some Q&A. Um, so I don't want to go into all the detail, but the Freedom Schools have a couple key components. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, an activity every morning called Harambe, which means let's pull together. It's a 30-minute activity. You'll get a, I'll show you a brief snippet in a second, which is centered around cheers and chants and getting students motivated for the day and talking about students and affirming them in ways that allow them to kind of think about how their days are going to go. Then there's a, a very intense and rigorous integrated reading curriculum that is culturally relevant that allows students to, to get individual attention where they need supports. Uh, and then there's this, this, this activity called DEAR, drop everything and read, right? So there's this real clear focus on literacy that happens with students as young as five years old and goes all the way up to 18 years old. Um, so I just want to give you a snapshot. So for 2014, we were in 11 freedom schools, and I should be clear about this. So six of the freedom schools are tied to community-based organizations. And last year, for the first time, we were in probation camps, five of them. Because in the probation camps, where we see a large number of black and brown males, we also see a, a high number of those students who are not reading uh, beyond a second grade uh, reading level. So again, we're talking about uh, 14, 15, 16-year-old young men who cannot read or who are not reading beyond a second, third, third grade reading level. So there's a desperate need to respond to this. So over the course of 2014, this is, this is my entire life over the summer, folks. So I used to have hair before I started this work. You see what happened to it, right? So we interview. I, I work with undergraduate students and graduate students. We interview over, um, we survey over 900 scholars. Uh, we interview about, about 100 of those. We also survey parents, staff, as well as site coordinators. Uh, and it's really a, a fully sort of integrative effort to, to collect data over the six-week period to see how can you move the needle with regard to literacy, but do it in a way that's, that's situated within a social and civic engagement uh, uh, context. I have way too much data to go through. I'm not going to do that to you because I know it would not be fun. But it's, it's some, a couple things that stand out here. And I just want to show you some of the scholastic reading inventory scores. We have seen some movement across our, our, our African American population that many folks did not think was possible. These data right here, if you look at the top, um, the top data right here shows where we saw the movement for our African American students. The pre-SRI scores were at 852. Uh, after six weeks, we saw a movement of 45 points here. We, we saw a slight regression for our Latino students. We're still trying to unpack why that movement has not been as, as strongly as we would like for it to be. But then across the board, here are the, the, here are the camps. right? So this was from the community-based organization. But across all the camps, we've seen movement across our, our EL speakers, our, our male scholars. Our, we have two uh, uh, female camps that were put in place. So you see growth across the board. So something is happening different in Freedom Schools. And it's really tied to this idea of, of recognizing where students have shortcomings recognizing that if you situate reading within a context of, of learning, we have all kind of survey data that students show they have an interest in reading, a desire to read more, uh, their efficacy has increased. So it, it's given us lots of improvement and lots of uh, really, I think, just encouraging results. And this is only after a six-week period. So part of what we're thinking, what would this look like if it was in place 12, 12 weeks or 15 weeks? And so this is some of the work that we've been doing that shows how you can begin to move the, 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 the needle again. Here, you look at some of our scores uh, across at least one of the male camps Camps and one of the female camps, we're seeing uh, uh, an increase of 60 points at Afroball, which is one of the, the camps, and, and 37 points uh, increase at, at one of the other sides. So we're seeing movement in some ways that I would not have imagined as a former reading teacher who taught uh, third graders for many, for, for many years. Moving any kind of needle when it comes to reading is a difficult thing to do. So seeing these kind of jumps really speaks to the potential that this program seems to be having. And we have a ton of qualitative data that also highlights why the students think this program helps, because they feel like they're not being sort of targeted because they have lower reading skills. They're not being made fun of and the like. Uh, and then not only has reading improved, but we also see major behavioral changes. And without, again, boring you on the details, the number of suspensions in the camps has, has, has decreased significantly in the month, the six weeks that we see the Freedom Schools in place. Uh, you see here, and again, we see in, 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 camp, in this camp, uh, part of the issue was, again, a lot of behavior problem, but they seem to be steady decreasing because what Freedom Schools stress is this importance of community and family. Uh, there's a restorative justice approach, not a discipline and punish approach which uh, a lot of the young people say that they appreciate because it allows them to be recognized as whole human beings. So, and what you see in it is, is really kind of uh, move away from what, what Haberman talks about is this pedagogy of poverty. Uh, when you walk into a lot of uh, urban schools, you see a lot of giving information, yes, no questions, uh, busy work. 
uh, the kind of stuff that really just bores students to tears. And you won't see that in freedom schools as opposed to seeing a pedagogy of poverty. You see more or less a pedagogy of plenty where kids are engaged on social issues. They, they problematize uh, issues that they see in their own communities. Uh, it's problem-focused learning. Uh, it's rigor. It's critical thinking. It's writing. It does a lot of things that engages students in the process of learning. Uh, and so what you see, our students are, are doing a lot of work around how they create metaphors, what are metaphors, how do you use them within the context of literacy, uh, creating analogies, how do you create analogies, what an analogy is. So you see these young people beginning to really think deeply about literacy in some ways that they, they say they never were able to do in, in a traditional school setting. Uh, even things such as summarizing and note taking. A lot of the students we tell take notes, but the students were telling us nobody ever told us how to take notes or showed us what no, good note taking looks like. So this process is designed to help give them skills that we assume students have, but we find that they oftentimes do not have, right? And then even non-linguistic representations that we get into, the students do a lot of graphic representations, uh, physical modules, mental pictures. This helps them to comprehend what they are reading in ways that allows them to show better re uh, results with regard to their literacy scores. Thank you.